Welcome back, everybody, to the Cleveland Guardians franchise here on MLB The Show 22. Today, we have the hour-long finale to the regular season here in year number two. Not only are we going to wrap up the regular season for the Major League team and find out once and for all if we end up making the playoffs, but we're also going to go through the double-A postseason as well. So it's pretty much two episodes, but combined into one. So grab a snack, get comfortable, because it's going to be a fun one. We're kind of going to bounce around in terms of the order that we're going to do things. We're going to go over these first two series for the big league club against the Blue Jays and the Twins. Then we're going to do all the double-A playoff stuff. And then we're going to hop back over to the major leagues and cover the last two series against Detroit and Kansas City. I know that might sound a little bit confusing, but just bear with me throughout the video. So as it stands now, we are 82-68. and 68. We're a game behind the White Sox for first place in the division with just 12 games left to go in the regular season. The wild card race is also very close as we're currently three and a half games behind the Blue Jays and Astros who are tied for the top two wild card spots currently. So as it stands now, we will not make the playoffs and we do have some ground control to do if we want to get a postseason spot or get a wild card spot. At the beginning of last episode, we talked about how well our offense as a team has been, and well, our offense as a team has been really good. We're in the top five in batting average, on base, slugging, OPS, hits, RBIs, home runs, walks, and least amount of strikeouts. That's pretty good. The pitching has been a little bit more up and down. Guys like Shane Bieber, Aaron Savale, and Edbert Alzale have been pretty inconsistent through the second half of the season. And the bullpen has had some guys who have been up and down, although the back end featuring Karinczak and Klasse has been very good since the start of the season. We have a number of guys in the running for some big time awards. Fran Mel Reyes is currently second for the American League MVP, only trailing Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Shane Bieber is currently third for the Cy Young, only behind Shohei Otani and Alec Manoa. And George Valera is second for the Rookie of the Year, only behind Raconde Diabokulis, the shortstop from the Chicago White Sox. We also have guys like Fran Mil Reyes and Jose Ramirez in the Silver Slugger nominations. Cattell Marte at one point was in the Silver Slugger race as well. So we're going to start with this Toronto series and then go over to the minor league stuff. Uh, the Blue Jays are a really good team. They're 85-64. and 64. They're one of the teams who are currently in front of us for a wild card spot. So this is a very important stretch of games. The first one, we won 6-2. Home run from Fran Mel Reyes. George Valera played very well, driving in three runs. He had a pair of extra base hits. We need as many wins as we can get here against Toronto because if we don't win the division, we've got to pass somebody in the AO wild card race. So hopefully it can be the Blue Jays. We're going to play the second game here. I wanted an opportunity to play against Alec Manoa, who is one of the two pitchers in the American League ahead of Shane Bieber for the Cy Young Award. And we get an opportunity to use Cal Quantrill, a native of Canada, returning home to play in Canada, which I find pretty cool. We'll see if the Cleveland Guardians can keep the wins going as we look at both lineups today, regular starters for Cleveland. That's what most of Cleveland's lineups are going to look like going forward because we need to treat every game left like a playoff game. Currently two games behind the Astros for the second wild card spot and two and a half behind the Toronto Blue Jays who are currently the number one wild card. The Blue Jays are in a very close division race of their own. Them and the Yankees are pretty much neck and neck for the most part. The Yankees are a little bit ahead of them. So just like us, they're trying to win their division too, but they're in a better spot than us because they do have the upper ground in terms of a wild card race. As I mentioned earlier, here is Alec Manoa, one of the best pitchers in the American League on the mound here against our lineup. George Valera, the rookie sensation, is going to ground this one up the middle for a base hit into center field. So a good start here for the offense as George Valera continues to look like a budding superstar. Here is a young rookie. That'll bring up Jose Ramirez, who's been a little bit up and down at times this year, but for the most part has been quite solid as he hits this one high and deep. In a right center field, back at the track, it's gone! Two-run homer for Jose Ramirez, and the Guardians are quickly on the board. J-Ram hits his 36th home run of the season. That one goes 415 feet, and the Guardians start this one up 2-0. Very quick start here in the first inning for Cleveland as we look at Cal Quantrill. 3.92 ERA, 1.21 whip for the Canadian native returning to his native country to pitch here against Toronto. Bo Bichette leads Vienna off for the Blue Jays. It's that one over the glove of Jose Ramirez into left field where Josh Bell is playing today. With Bobby Bradley's late season emergence, he's getting a lot of the looks at first base. 
And Josh Bell just so happened can play the corner outfield spots as well. Here's the following batter. Cameron Eden hits that one high and deep in the left field. And that one is gone. The first career Major League home run for Cameron Eden. And Toronto quickly ties it at two. So both teams start this one off strong offensively with a pair of two-run homers from Jose Ramirez and Cam Eden. Probably the two most polar opposite guys I can think of. Guerrero hits that one up in the air. A jumping grab by Andres Jimenez for the first out of the inning. Two away now for Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Full count pitch on its way. He goes down looking on the curveball. So both offenses start off strong with a pair of two-run homers from Jose Ramirez and Cameron Eden as we move to the second. The young catcher Luis Campusano with a big swing to this on the slider. Although Alec Manoa's gotten off to a slow start today, we know he's one of the best pitchers in baseball, so I expect him to catch a groove. It looks like Cal Quantrill is also catching a groove as he gets Matt Chapman to go down on the curveball. Both pitchers really starting to look a little bit better. Here's Kuatse Lemia. He's third in the American League Rookie of the Year race, and he strikes out on the curveball again. That curveball's been filthy today for Cal Quantrill. This time it's the slider. It'll get David Green to go down looking. There aren't many better feelings as a pitcher than getting three Ks in a row in one inning. Three Ks in a row in real life, not quite as good. Let's go to the top of the third. Here is Cattell Barte, who's going to single that one into center field, so the leadoff man is aboard. This is a nice opportunity for the meat of the Cleveland lineup to do some damage. One away for Jose Ramirez, who homered earlier. This one looks like it has a chance to go over the fence as well, and it sure will. Two-run shot for Jose Ramirez, his second of the ball game, and we're just in the third inning. Jose Ramirez is 37th of the year, and the Cleveland Guardians are back up ahead 4-2 as we go to the bottom of the third inning. Danny Jansen, the catcher, leads it off, grounds that one past the glove of Ketel Marte for a leadoff single. So we'll see if the Toronto Blue Jays are able to respond as that'll bring up Flo Bichette, who grounds it right to Ramirez, way overthrows Ketel Marte. So instead of turning the double play, now the Blue Jays have runners on first and third with nobody else. An E5 for Ramirez, which on paper would completely change the trajectory of the inning, but not so fast as Vladimir Guerrero Jr. grounds into a double play of his own. That'll end the inning. Nobody scores, and it remains 4-2. We move to the top of the fourth. Bobby Bradley with a moonshot into left center field. That baby's gone, and it's now 5-2. Bobby Bradley, in very limited at-bats this season in the big league level, has been really, really good. That's his fifth home run of the year, and from there, the Cy Young candidate, Alec Manoa, will be taken out of the game. He's going to be replaced by Julian Merriweather, who has an ERA at 5.26. His first batter here in the top of the fifth is George Valera. He's going to draw a walk, so Valera is aboard. That'll bring up Jose Ramirez, two for two today with a pair of two-run shots. He's got a chance to add a third here. As the count is 2-2, two and two, and he swings and misses at the high fastball. Not in the strike zone. Ramirez usually has great discipline, but not that time. Fran Mil Reyes, the possible MVP candidate, is now up. He also goes down on the high fastball. Julian Merriweather looking a lot better than Alec Manoa did, which is an odd surprise. That'll bring up Josh Bell, who's reached base in each of his first two at-bats today. Is he going to make it three in a row? No, sir. He goes down on the check swing. Again, three Ks in a row there for Toronto in the fifth. We go to the bottom half of the inning where Cal is still cooking. He gets David Green on the strikeout. Here's Danny Jansen, 1-2, swinging way too early on the curveball. Cal Quantrill's not really known as a strikeout artist, but that's what he's been doing today. Well, until there. Bo Bichette with a solo home run in the left center field. And for the first time since this first inning... The Blue Jays' offense has done something of note as it's now 5-3. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is going to go down on the curve. So that'll probably end Cal Quantrill's day. Three innings, five earned. Not his best performance, but not his worst either. He struck out a lot of guys. Tim Maeza will be on the mound here in the sixth inning for the Blue Jays. 4.22 ERA. Leadoff man is Eddie Rosario, who slaps this one nicely into right field. Little lefty on lefty. Crime! As it's going to be a home run for Eddie Rosario. And the Cleveland Guardians are back up by three. The big trade deadline acquisition from the Texas Rangers with his 21st home run of the season. And Cleveland is back up by three. Following batter, Luis Campusano grounds that one up the middle. Bichette cannot make the play. So that'll be a single into center field for Campusano. Still nobody out, by the way. Big opportunity for the Guardians to really extend this lead. 
Andres Jimenez for shortstop. Singles it in the left field. So the first three base runners of the inning are aboard. One of them has already obviously scored. That'll bring up Bobby Bradley. He goes down looking on the outside sinker. Count was full. He thought it was a ball. Doesn't get the call. Cattell Marte now, who usually rakes against lefties. Not quite this time. He grounds into a double play. So Cleveland only scores one in that inning. It certainly feels like they could have gotten more as Keenan Middleton is on the mound here in the bottom of the six for the Guardians. He is a sub 3.7 ERA, and he'd get through the inning no problem, striking out Matt Chapman to finish it off. Into the seventh now, Yimmy Garcia is in for Toronto. He's had a nice year, 3.16 ERA. Leadoff batter is George Valera, who's going to slap this one weakly into right center field, but it will go for a hit as the second baseman, David Green, is unable to make the play. So Valera is on base once again. That'll bring up the Franimal, Franimal Reyes, who grounds it right to Green over to Bichette, who gets it to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. That's a 4-6-3 double play. Still remains 6-3. Let's go now to the bottom half of the inning with Camilo Duvall checking in. I accidentally clicked X so fast he couldn't see his numbers, but he's pitched in, like, what, 65 games, 3.7-ish ERA. He's been good this year as Eddie Rosario misses the dive. It'll be a ground rule double for David Green, his fourth of the year. So with one away, the Blue Jays have a runner in scoring position. Danny Jansen draws a walk, so now there's two on. Duvall kind of struggling as the tie and run is at the plate. It's Bo Bichette who's going to pop this one into foul territory. Doink! Campusano cannot make the grab. I don't know how he missed that one. They didn't even call that as an error. Following play, grounded to Ramirez. He tags Green. Throw over to first in time. Maybe Luis Campusano big-brained it. He went for the drop knowing the next play would be a double play. Nonetheless, it's 6-3 as we go into the 8th. Yimmy Garcia remains in for Toronto as he walks Omar Narvaez, who checks in for Campusano after that horrible defensive play. Following batter is Andres Jimenez. Full count, two outs. Jimenez is going to ground this one over to short. Bichette quickly gets it over to second. The Toronto bullpen has been pretty good today. Yimmy Garcia with two strong innings. The problem is Cleveland's bullpen is holding strong as well. Now that it's time for the back end to come in, the Blue Jays probably don't have a lot of hope. James Karinczak with a nasty knuckle curve on Cameron Eden. And now Guriel, he is falls victim to the fastball. It's crazy how bad Karinczak was last year and how good he has been this year. As we go to the ninth, Scott Alexander is in for Toronto. 2.82 ERA, only in 22 and a third innings as he faces off against a lefty killer, Jalen Davis, who enters the game as a pinch hitter. Davis hitting over 300 off the bench this season as he's going to get an infield single. So Davis is aboard with nobody out. We'll see if the Cleveland Guardians can drive him in. Can tell Marte, did he go around? He did. So a big strikeout there for Alexander. We'll see if he can keep it going here against Jose Ramirez, who, of course, is homer twice today from the left side of the plate. And he gets plunked. So now there's two runners aboard here for Fran Mil Reyes, who's been pretty quiet. 0 for 4. 1 2 on its way. See you later, alligator. Three run bomb for Reyes, who shows what the Bautista like bat flip. And it's 9 3. The Cleveland Guardians pretty much iced this game away. Cleveland thought they were going to need to go to their closer, Emmanuel Classe, but that doesn't look like it'll be the case after Reyes hits his 39th home run of the year. Instead, it'll be Oinks Quackenbush, who looks to finish off the game. He'll probably do exactly that. Two-way runner on second. This is Jansen, who flies in into center. Caught by Valera. And the Cleveland Guardians win this one by the final score of 9-3. to Strong win today here for Cleveland. No matter what happens in the third and final game of this series, Cleveland will have won it. So we're really doing a good job of making up some ground here in the wild card against the Toronto Blue Jays with a dominant victory here today. Nine runs, 13 hits. The offense was really good for the most part, and we really did well with runners on base. Four runs for Rosario, Bradley Reyes, and two for Jose Ramirez, Cal Quantrill, five innings, three earned runs, nine strikeouts, and then the bullpen completely shut the door. Middleton, Duvall, Karen Shack, and Quackenbush all did a great job. For Toronto, three runs, seven hits. They had the two-run homer from Cameron Eden in the first, his first Major League home run. Bo Bichette went deep in the fifth, but other than that, they weren't great. Alec Manoa really struggled getting the loss. The bullpen minus Alexander was fine, but it wasn't enough to... Uh, really avenge those early innings. Unfortunately, we don't get the sweep. We lose the last game 6 to nothing. but I guess that's what happens when both George Valera and Fran Mil Reyes don't play. Jose Barrios went the entire game, a complete game shutout. 
So we're now going to simulate through this Minnesota series. They're a bad team, 62 and 90. As it stands now, we're a game and a half behind the White Sox. We're two and a half behind both Toronto and Houston for the second wild card. As we would end up taking two of three against the Twins. Our most notable game was an 8-0 shutout win where Shane Bieber pitched a complete game, only allowing four hits. So after that series, we're still a game behind the White Sox with only six games left to play. And we're still two games behind both the Blue Jays and the Astros for one of the wild card spots. So our final six games of the year all at home against a bad Tigers team and a decent Royals team who's already been eliminated. So they're not really playing for a whole lot. But remember, they hate our guts. So they're going to try to play spoiler. The White Sox last six games are at home as well. They play the Yankees, who are right in the thick of things for a wild card spot. And then they play Detroit. Toronto's last six games are on the road against a bad Baltimore team and a solid Boston team, who, again, is already eliminated. And then the Astros had their last six games at home. Three against the Angels, who have already clinched the number one seed. So although they're really good, they're not playing for a whole lot. And then the Mariners, who, again, they're a pretty good team, but they've also already been eliminated. So we're going to simulate these first two games here against the Tigers to get to the end of the minor league seasons as we would win both of those games. So now there's only four games to go as both of the minor league seasons have just end. I'm assuming you guys are kind of on the edge of your seats of what's going to happen here at the end of the regular season if we make the playoffs or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop talking about the major league stuff. We're going to talk about the minor league playoffs, and then we're going to go back to the big league stuff at the end of the episode to see if we do end up making the playoffs. So starting in AAA, the Columbus Clippers fell just short of the playoff spot, finishing the season 81-69. and We were not able to get a wild card spot or win the division, but it was very close. Uh, some of the notable prospects here include Gabriel Arias, Will Benson, Escobar Nakata de Lima, Dustin Harris. Those guys are all going to have an opportunity to possibly be big leaguers within the next year or so. Luis Toribio and John Kenzie Noel are also pretty solid as well. And then the pitching rotation was quite solid. Daniel Espino was really good in 60 innings in AAA after being called up from AA Akron. Gavin Williams, another very good prospect here as well, who pitched a little bit in the major leagues this season. But most of our focus with the minor league stuff today is going to be with the AA team because they are in the playoffs at 75 and 63. We won the AA Northwest Division by two games over Erie, who we're going to play in the first round of the playoffs. Our notable guys here in AA include our first round pick last year, Zane Rowley, who has really progressed well this season, hitting over 300. Rowley has definitely met expectations and may have an opportunity in spring training next year to make some noise. We've also got our second round pick, Ramon Ramiro, who had a really good year, plus 11 contact against lefties. He's a 73 overall and also has a great shot to be a major leaguer as soon as next year. Robert Hassel, Bayron Laura, Kevin Alcantara are, are other notable prospects in terms of hitters. And then the rotation is filled with talented players as well. Logan Allen, Marcos Villalobos, Ricky Watkins are all very good prospects in our system. Edward Cabrera as well, who we got in a trade from the Marlins this year, although he did struggle in AAA, which is why he's down here. And then the bullpen has been shut down as well. This is a really, really talented group here in AA, and I did want to send some guys down from AAA to help us for our playoff run, like Daniel Espino, Dustin Harris, Escobar Nakata de Lima, and I chose these players because they spent most of the year in double-A, so I feel like it's fair to give them an opportunity to get some playoff action because they spent most of the year in double-A, so it's not like I brought down all of our really good minor leaguers, but I brought down guys who spent most of the year in double-A Akron. They're going to have an opportunity to finish out the season here with their teammates in the playoffs, and I definitely think we really strengthened our roster going into this postseason as we start here with the Erie Seawolves, the AA affiliate of the Detroit Tigers. We're going to be mostly simcasting games, and if they're good, we're going to hop in late. Franklin Perez is on the mound today for Erie as we score two in the bottom of the second. They answer with one in the third. Pretty close start so far. Daniel Espino has been pretty good as we would make a pitching change after five. It's time for the bullpen to come in and shut this one down. Kevin Kelly with two good innings. Still 4-1 to one here in the 8th. Cal Coronado is a strong inning. So now it's down to the closer, R.D. McKay in the ninth, and he allows 5. Yeah. So we're going to go here in the bottom of the ninth inning. We're now down by 2. 
Junior Garcia, the lefty, is in for the save. Interesting strategy to bring in a lefty because we've got some guys here at the top of the order, specifically Ramon Ramiro, who's hitting third in this inning, who rake against lefties. We start with Escobar Nakana de Lima. He strikes out of the high fastball. Big start for Garcia. That'll bring up Zane Rowley, who hits that one off the glove of the third baseman. The shortstop doesn't go for it at all, for whatever reason. And that'll be an infield single for Rowley, the 15th overall pick in last year's draft. Now we've got Ramon Ramiro up. He's over three, but again, he absolutely rakes against lefties. This one looks like it could go for extra bases. A double into the right field wall. Rowley's going to hold up at third. No reason to send him home with one out and still being down by two. So now there's a pair of runners in scoring position. A huge opportunity for Robert Hassel, acquired in a trade deadline deal with the Padres. He's going to single into left field. Zane Rowley scores, and it's now six to five. Maybe we could have sent Ramon Ramirez. The throw was offline, but no real reason to risk it. So that's going to bring up the number five hitter, our designated hitter, Kevin Alcantara, who's 0 for 4 today. Hopefully he can change that here as he's going to pop this one up. Should be caught, but that's probably going to be enough room to drive in Ramon Ramiro, who will attempt to tag up. The throw from the center fielder is not in time, so Ramiro will score, and the Akron Rubber Ducks complete the comeback as we are now tied at 6. Now we've got the opportunity for a walk-off. That'll bring up the number six hitter, Dustin Harris, as Andres Soltilet will check in for Erie. I don't know why they put a righty in here against Harris, who hits well against righties. I guess that's the reason why Erie's managers are in double-A and not the majors, because their decision-making isn't the smartest. Well, Dustin Harris would strike out, so it doesn't really matter. Game tied at six here as we go into the 10th inning. Andrew Bajajek is in for the Akron Rubber Ducks. The minor league extra innings runners rule does apply in the minor league playoffs. So Erie opened up with a runner here in the top of the 10th at second base. And they're going to drive them in here with an RBI single. So the Erie Seawolves now lead this game by the score of 7-6. to six. That'll bring up the following batter, Drew Romo, who's going to ground into a 3-6-3 three, three double play. Good work from the infield, but Erie does lead 7-6 off of a potentially game-winning single from Jared Young. Jose Tena leads off the bottom of the 10th here for the Rubber Ducks. He draws a walk, so he's at first. Dustin Harris, who's really fast for a first baseman with like 80 speed, is at second. Here's a pinch hitter, Yairo Pomares. He goes down on the changeup. Big strikeout there for the Seawolves, as that'll bring up the first baseman, Brandon Bossier. This one is high and deep and caught. Nearly a home run. That one was at the warning track as Harris, with his 81 speed correction, will tag up to third. So runners on the corners here, a huge opportunity for the leadoff man, Escobar Nakata de Lima, who's down to his final strike. One-two pitch on its way, and Nakata de Lima comes up clutch, splitting that one right between the pitcher's legs for a game-tying single. We are now knotted up at seven. Now that'll bring up the young 18-year-old outfielder, Zane Rowley, who with a base hit can win this game. Two-two pitch, hits this one nicely in the left center, and that's gonna drop. Jose Tena will head home. The throw, actually, they're going to try to go to third. I don't know why they did that, but it doesn't matter. The Erie Seawolves fall victim to our Akron Rubber Ducks here in game one of the first round of the AA playoffs, losing this one by the final score of 8-7. to seven. Quite the exciting game. As we go back to that ninth inning, you know how they scored five runs? It was not necessarily because of poor pitching. It was because of an error but it was on the pitcher, R.D. McKay. So he didn't allow any earned runs, but he's the reason why they all scored because of an error caused by him. I don't know. I found that kind of funny. So now we're going to hop into the second game here of the series. We've got Ricky Watkins, the lefty from Jamaica, who will be on the mound in this one. He'll face off against Nick Mears. Watkins missed a large chunk of the year with an injury, but when he was healthy, he was really, really good. I think he finished with an ERA at about 1.5. The offense scores three in the bottom of the first inning, aided by a home run from Kevin Alcantara. Now it's six to nothing. The offense is cruising. Ricky Watkins is dominating. I don't think we're going to need to hop into this game as it's now 9-1 to one here in the ninth inning. We want Watkins to get the complete game, and that's what happens. Double play is going to finish it off. 9-1 is your final. A big win here for Akron with 17 hits. The offense was great, particularly Kevin Alcantara, who goes four for five of the home run, driving in four. Rowley had a triple. Torrentino, Duran, and Bozier all drove in runs, and obviously Ricky Watkins was great with a complete game. So I was excited to see what Edward Cabrera did here in this third game, but the game right beforehand automatically called him up to triple A, 
And since we're in the playoffs, I can't bring him down to double A, which is stupid. So I guess he's not going to be here for our playoff run again. Unfortunately, instead of him, it'll be Marcos Villalobos, who's very good in his own right. He faces off against Franklin Perez, who pitched in game one. So he pitched like two days ago, and clearly he looks like he's on two days rest, as Perez would really struggle to start this one off. Villalobos, on the other hand, is doing very well, as it's 4-1 here in the bottom of the eighth inning. No score since the third, but as I say that, we had two in the ninth. So it's now 6-1. to one. Since this is an elimination game, I wanted to hop in and finish it off, as we start with Adinzo Reyes, who strikes out on the changeup. As you can see, Marcos Villalobos is going for the complete game. He's not even 90 pitches yet. He's done a good job of keeping the pitch count low. Here's Daniel Cabrera. Flies this one into right. Robert Hassel, the third, is under it for the second out of the inning. And the Erie Seawolves season comes down to this last out. It'll be with the cleanup man, Reynaldo Rivera, the 2-2, grounded to short. Jose Tana fields it cleanly. The throw to first is in time. And the Akron Rubber Ducks are advancing to the Double A Championship Series as they defeat Erie 6-1 in a three-game sweep, aided by dominant pitching in Game 1. Daniel Espino, five innings, only allows one earned run. Game 2, Ricky Watkins, our third-round pick last year, complete game, only allowing one run. And then here in the elimination game, in Game 3, our fourth-round pick last year, Marcos Villalobos, complete game, only allowing one run. The team ERA through these three games ended up being under one, which is really, really impressive because, again, most of those runs in game one was because of the error on R.D. McKay, the pitcher. Dustin Harris goes three for five of a home run and five RBIs. Kevin Alcantara hits his second home run in as many days, and obviously Marcos Villalobos was fantastic. So with that, we have now won the Northeast Southwest. Don't those directions contradict each other? Well, we won the division playoff season Series, and we're now going to be facing off against the Fisher Cats in the AA Northeast Championship Series. This is the AA affiliate of the Toronto Blue Jays, who, who knows, we may face off against in the Major League playoffs. Starting with Simcast in Game 1 here, Logan Allen on the mound, and we're currently trailing 3-0. The offense is really struggling at the moment. Allen went five innings, allowing three earned, but we did get three in the seventh, so we're back in it here with two innings to go. Uh, we're hoping the offense can do something here in the eighth. Not going to happen. So in the bottom of the eighth, Kevin Kelly looking to make through as he does a lot of walk. But other than that, he does just fine. So we're going to go in the ninth inning, down by one, looking to make some noise here to come back here in game one of the series. The game comes down to Zane Rowley with two away, who's going to fly this one into left, and it will drop for a hit. Okay, so we've got a runner aboard. Oh, maybe not. Rowley goes second. He's gunned down. Zane Rowley tried to be aggressive, and it backfires. So the New Hampshire Fisher Cats win game one of the five-game championship series, three to four. The offense wasn't as great today. We only really did damage in the seventh. Logan Allen gets the loss. He didn't pitch great. The bullpen was fine, but they didn't do enough to get the dub. So that brings us to game two now. Still on the road. Hoping we can get back here with a win. Tobias Myers is on the mound. He's mainly our lawn reliever, but again, we were supposed to have Edward Cabrera pitch at some point and just kind of got screwed over with that. We do score one in the top of the first inning. But it doesn't look like uh, we might win this game. We're down 5-2 to two here in the fifth inning. Tobias Harris did not... Did I just call him Tobias Harris? I meant Tobias Myers did not pitch very well as it's now 7-2. to two. We had one in the eighth inning, but I don't think it's going to be enough here. Down by four in the ninth. I really don't see a world where we win this game. So I figured rather than hopping in, we would just simcast, hope for the best. And that's not going to happen. So we lose game two by the score of 7-3. to three. We did get 12 hits, which was more than them. So it's not that we didn't get base runners. It's that we didn't capitalize whenever we got base runners. And now our backs are against the wall. We got to win three in a row, just like we did against Erie in the first round. Our championship hopes are on the line here. We've got Daniel Espino, the ace of the staff, on the mound against C.J. Van Ick of the New Hampshire Fisher Cats. As after Espino, if we do win this game, we've got... Ricky Watkins and Marcos Villalobos are three great pitchers, so hopefully those three can clutch up. We're still going to quick manage this game, even though it is an elimination game, but if it gets close in like the fifth, sixth, seventh inning, I'm more likely to hop in quicker. If this game or if this series does go to a game five, then we will play the whole game. 
Well, it looks like we're going to win this game as of now as we scored four in the second inning. And meanwhile, Daniel Espino is cruising. We had five in the seventh, so it looks like this game is over. I figured no reason to keep Espino in since we're up by eight. And we finish off the game winning nine to one. So we're back in it. We're only down two to one now. The offense again was great. 13 hits, but unlike last game, we actually capitalized with runners on base. Uh, with Nakata de Lima, Alcantara, Harris, and Tano all driving in runs. Espino was great. Kevin Kelly finished off the game very strong as well. So now we're going to hop into game four. We've got our main man, Ricky Watkins, on the mound. He'll go against Adrian Hiller, who was a third-round pick of the Blue Jays last year. And he's actually a really good prospect. He's got eight potential, which is even better than Ricky Watkins. But Watkins has been better throughout the season, so hopefully we can count on him to pitch really well today. And so far, both pitchers are looking really good. Watkins is doing his job, but so is Adrian Hiller. New Hampshire scores one in the six, so it's now one nothing. Neither pitcher has been taken out of the game as we now go into the eighth inning. One nothing. Our season's on the line, so I figured I'd hop in. Both pitchers are still in as Ricky Watkins' first batter, the catcher Drew Romo. He's going to hit this one down the line and fair in a left field for a double. Got to look out for the possibility of making a pitching change. Watkins is at around 90 pitches. If he starts to struggle, maybe we take him out. So far in the postseason, Watkins has pitched a complete game, and he could go the entire way this one as he gets the fellow lefty to go down looking on the slider. Two away for Jorman Rodriguez, but one, two. Got him looking again on the slider. Eight dominant innings for Ricky Watkins, who's been great today, but the problem is he has not gotten any run support. Kevin Alcantara goes down looking with two away. Alcantara has been great in the playoffs, but when we needed him most, he doesn't make a big play. Jose Tain has also been really good. It looks like he might have come up short as well as this one has flown into foul territory, caught by the left fielder. So our season comes down to one more inning. I'm confident Ricky Watkins can hold it down in the ninth as he does allow a base hit to Brown to open up the inning. But we're going to ride with Ricky Watkins the rest of the way. Unless it gets really bad, we're going to keep him in the entire game because I trust him. Do I trust our hitting? No, not really. Brown's going to steal second, so with one away, the Fisher Cats now have a runner in scoring position as that brings up Brozabon with two away. This one is hit nicely into center, and it will be caught. Zane Rowley saves a run from being put on the board. Great defense as we go to the bottom of the ninth. Eight, nine, one hitters due up for the Rubber Ducks. The season comes down to this. Will they keep Adrian Hiller on the mound? No, they're going to go to the bullpen. Jackson Reese in for the save. I think this is a mistake for the Fisher Cats, but hopefully we can capitalize as the pinch hitter, Bayron Laura, strikes out on the slider. Our season comes down to two more outs. That starts with the switch hitting infielder, Aaron Brocco, who singles into center field. So Brocco is aboard with one away. The top of the order is due up. That starts with the outfielder, Escobar Nakana de Lima. One for three today. 2-1 pitch on its way. And this one looks like it's hit nicely and will go for a base hit. Oh boy, this might have just gotten interesting. Tie and run at second, winning run at first. Single ties the game, extra base hit wins it. It's Zane Rowley now up. One away, the biggest at bat for the young 18-year-old as he chops that one up, slams his bat in frustration, and is out. What was that? Zane Rowley, I get he's talented, but the body language on that play is just horrible. He didn't hit it well, so instead of hustling, he slams his bat, or whatever is left of it, instead of running to first. Probably would have been out anyway, but still, you can't do that in an elimination playoff game, dude. So now it comes down to Robert Hassell with two away. Flies this one in the left. Very catchable, and it is caught, and the season comes to a close. The New Hampshire Fisher Cats have won the AA Northeast Championship Series, defeating the Akron Rubber Ducks in four games. A very unfortunate ending to the playoffs here for the Rubber Ducks, who last year got eliminated prematurely in the first round. Last year's team was led by guys like Brian Rocchio, George Valera, Gabriel Arias, and Will Benson. Those guys are too good for double-A, and I think the stars of this team, guys like Zane Rowley, even though that last play was, well, pretty immature of him. Rowley, Ramon Ramiro, Ricky Watkins, Daniel Espino, guys like that. Again, I don't think they're going to be in double-A next year because they're just a little bit too good. Adrian Hiller was fantastic. Eight scoreless innings, he gets the win. Ricky Watkins gets the loss. He went the entire way, only allowing one run. He was great, but... The offense laid an egg. He didn't score a single run, so that's how the double-A season comes to a close. Certainly an exciting playoff run, nonetheless, as we swept the Erie Sea Wolves, and then we won uh, one game here in this uh, championship series against New Hampshire. So even though the double-A playoffs are done, the episode is not done 
Remember, we started off with the Major League stuff, then we moved to the Minor League playoffs, and then I said at the end of the video, we're going to go through these final four games of the Major League regular season and figure out if the Cleveland Guardians will be in the playoffs or not. So enough waiting and anticipation. Let's answer the question that we have been asking since the start of the season. Will the Cleveland Guardians be playing in the Major League playoffs? So with four games to go, we're 88 and 70. We have one against Detroit with the Tiger killer, Shane Bieber, on the mound. And then we've got three games against the Royals. We are now currently tied with the White Sox for first place in the division. That's not the only tie around the majors is the Yankees and Blue Jays are tied in the East. So as it stands now, there are pretty much six teams fighting for five playoff spots in the AL. The Angels have clinched one of them. So of these five teams, the Yankees, the Blue Jays, the Astros, the White Sox, and the Guardians, four of these teams are going to get playoff spots. One of them will not. One of the Yankees and Blue Jays will win the American League East, so we don't have to worry about one of those teams in the wild card hunt. We've got the Astros, who are currently a game ahead of us and Chicago, so as it still stands now, chances are us and Chicago need to win the division in order to make the playoffs. The National League is a lot less climactic. All five teams have already clinched. It's only really a matter of who wins the NL Central, and the Brewers have like a three-game lead over the Cardinals, so it's kind of obvious Milwaukee's going to win it. So the American League is obviously a lot more interesting here as we're just going to simcast or fully play out our last four games because they're all super important and I don't just want to simulate right through them. As we warm up for this game against the Tigers, Cattel Marte suffered his shoulder tightness. Normally, I wouldn't play him through the injury, but again, this is practically a playoff game for us, so we kind of need him to play. So he is not going to miss this one. Shane Bieber on the mound against Tariq Skubal, and as we know, Shane Bieber dominates against the Detroit Tigers, except for last time, but other than that, he kills them, and he's doing that against. With through six innings, we lead 5-0, now it's 5-1, Shane Bieber's still in, as he allows a two-run homer to Riley Green, who's been dominant today, so from there, we take Bieber out, Karen Check gets through the eighth. The game is still 5-3 here, going into the ninth inning, as we call on our closer, Emmanuel Classe, so this I found really interesting, Michael Franco singles, Victor Reyes bunts him over. Makes sense. The following batter, Bubba Thompson, would also bunt him. I get why you would do the one bunt, but why bunt him twice? Your odds of getting a run with a runner on third and two outs are a lot lower than one out and a runner on second. Now, I'm not complaining because we won the game because of it, but still, very odd decision making there by Detroit, whose offense really struggled today, minus Riley Green, who drove in all three of their runs off of a pair of homers. Our offense was pretty solid. Five runs, nine hits, homers for Reyes and Valera. Shane Bieber was very good in his likely final start of the year. Seven and two-thirds innings, three earned runs and the win, and the bullpen slammed the door as well. As for the other teams in the race for all of these American League playoff spots, the Yankees just won, but it's not a bad thing because they beat the White Sox. The Blue Jays lost to Baltimore. The Astros ended up doing pretty well against the Angels, winning that last game. And obviously, as I said, the White Sox lost. So with three more games and one more series left, we are now finally back in first place of the division, albeit only by one game over the Chicago White Sox, who have the series at home against Detroit. We have a three-game series at home against the Royals. The Royals are a little bit better than the Tigers. As for the wild card stuff, we are currently only one game behind the Astros for that second wild card spot at the moment. So we've got this first game here against Kansas City. Aaron Savale on the mound against Taylor Hearn. Again, since it's practically a playoff game, I'm going to simcast it, and if it's close, we're going to hop in and try to get the win. Savale has been a little bit inconsistent this year, but clearly he's been better than Taylor Hoener. He's got an ERA in the sixes. Gattel Marte is still not 100%, and I still don't care because, again, it's practically like a playoff game. Even though the Royals are already eliminated, I know they would love to play spoiler against us because, as you know from earlier in the year, these two teams do not like each other at all. The Royals put up two of the thirds, so they're leading early. Taylor Hearns pitching very well until he would suffer an injury, so he'd have to be replaced by Carlos Hernandez, who's hopefully going to go a couple innings for them, or for our sake, hopefully doesn't go a couple innings. Still 2-1 to one here in the eighth inning. James Karinczak kept in. Since it's close, I figured I would hop in to try to get the win as Andrew Benintendi goes down to the low fastball. Good start there for Karinczak, getting the first out of the inning. That'll bring up the catcher, Salvador Perez. He goes down on the two-seam fastball. James Karinczak still one of the nastiest pitchers in all of baseball as he tries to go for the one, two, three, and he does, striking out Mitch Henniger on the fastball. Quick work there from James Karinczak as we move to the bottom of the eighth. We'll see if the offense can come up clutch here against Jake Brents. 
6.1 ERA in 25 appearances. He is a lefty. First batter, George Valera. Hitless today, but he does draw a walk. So Valera is aboard. That'll bring up Josh Bell, who would be out. The following batter also out for Andres Jimenez. He goes down looking on the slider. So the offense doesn't really get anything going here in the 8th. Now into the ninth inning, we trail 2-1. to one. And Karinczak is still mowing down as he gets Bobby Witt to strike out on the off-speed pitch low and away. Andrew Enciarte, who looks awfully a lot like Gru in his picture on the scoreboard, he will single that one into right field as Cattell Marte is unable to make the play. So Enciarte is aboard. That'll bring up the nine-hitter Charlie Culberson. Strikes out on the two-seamer. Five strikeouts for James Karinczak as he gets through the ninth pretty easily. And now we go to the bottom of the ninth. 9-1-2, Straw, Rosario, Marte do up for Cleveland as they face all against Scott Barlow, one of the better closers in the American League, looking to finish off the game here for the Royals and win them this first game of the series. We start with Eddie Rosario, 1-4-4 four, four today, 2-2 two, two pitch on its way, lines that one nicely in the right field for a hit. So the Guardians have a man aboard with one away, and we'll see if they can capitalize. It's now Cattell Marte. Up to the plate. Count is 2-1. and one. Pitch on its way from Barlow. This one is a ground and a third. Double play possibility. To second for one. To first for the other. And the Kansas City Royals win game one of this final regular season series. 2-1. to one. Good start for the Royals here playing spoiler. Our pitching was really good. Aaron Savale did quite well. The bullpen did their job. James Karinczak was a total beast. But the offense just didn't really produce. Andres Jimenez, the only one to drive in a run. He had a solo homer. Only extra base hit was a double from Straw. So with now two games left to go in the season, we're 89-71. and 71. Looking at some of the other teams that we need to follow along with. The New York Yankees lost to the Texas Rangers. That's good news. The Blue Jays beat Boston, so they are now tied with the Yankees. The Astros beat Seattle. As for the Chicago White Sox, they ended up losing. So we're still a game ahead of them. As we look at the American League wild card, you may notice that the Yankees, Blue Jays, and Astros have all clinched playoff spots. So that means that we're not going to get a wild card spot. So of the four playoff spots that were up for grabs, three of them have been clinched by the Yankees, the Blue Jays, and the Astros. So that means the last playoff spot will be the winner of the AL Central between us and the White Sox, and whoever does not win the AL Central is eliminated. We do have the upper hand at the moment, currently a game ahead of Chicago with two left to play, but we've still got to be on our A game here because now we know the margin for error is very, very slim. Cattell Marte is still not 100%, but he is still 100% going to play. Cal Quantrill on the mound for us today. He will be opposed by Caleb Killian of the Royals. We would get an early RBI double from Jose Ramirez. The Royals would score two in the second. We add one in the bottom half of the inning, so the game is tied at two after the hot start from the offenses. Both would be quiet for a little while until the fifth, in which we score four. So we now lead six to three. Now it's only within one as they add two in the seventh. So we go into the eighth inning. In game one of this series, we were down by one in the eighth. Now we're up by one. So we're going to hop in here, starting off with Mitch Hanniger, who will single this one into center field. So the Royals open up the inning with an early base runner. We'll see if the Royals are going to be able to drive him in and look to tie the game as Hanniger will be replaced by pinch runner Bobby Witt Jr. Gio Urshela is now up. Witt looking for second. The throw from Campusano is not in time. So it's a stolen base for Bobby Witt. And with nobody out, the Royals have a runner in scoring position. Witt would advance to third. That brings up the next batter, Isaac Benitez, who it's a bomb in the right field. And the Royals lead him 7-6. I'm pretty sure the last time we played Kansas City, I called Isaac Benitez the Cleveland killer. Benitez has not had a very good season this year, but whenever he plays us, he dominates. Jose Alvarez quickly taken out of the game. He'll be replaced by Camilo Duvall, who looks to get out of this inning unscathed with Cleveland now trailing. Edward Olivares, his first batter, singles into center, so not a good start. The Royals have a 91-speed base runner aboard and another great opportunity to score. Adalberto Mondesi rips that one down the left field line for extra bases. The runner at third, he's going to round, head home. The throw from the cutoff man, Ramirez, is not in time. It's an RBI double for Adalberto Mondesi. It's now 8-6. Mondesi is no slouch on the base pass as well. He is 90 speed, so Duvall's got to get out of this jam as he strikes out Kyle Eastbell for the second out. And then Nicky Lopez, 1-2, goes down on the slider. A big eighth inning for the Kansas City Royals as they score three. 
and now lead this game 8-6 to six as we go into the bottom of the eighth inning. Hopefully the offense can come up clutch as it's going to be Josh Stormont in relief for the Royals. 5.19 ERA in 36 appearances is opening batter for shortstop Andres Jimenez, who's going to draw a walk. So Jimenez is aboard. The tie-in run is up to the plate. It's the top of the order. Starting with Cattell Marte, he would be out. The following batter would also be out, Valera. And then with two away, Ramirez is going to pop this one up to the catcher, and it will be caught by Salvador Perez. So we now go into the ninth inning with the Cleveland Guardians trailing 8-6. to six. Keenan Middleton will come into the game here for Cleveland, looking to not add to this Kansas City lead because that wouldn't be good. Bronson Kluterman, the leadoff man, will single into right field, so the Royals quickly have a runner aboard. We'll see if they can do some damage, extend this lead further, as that'll bring up Gio Urshela with two away. Count is full, strikes out. Good inning for Keenan Middleton. He allows the early base hit, but nothing happens after that. We go to the bottom of the ninth inning now, 4-5-6. Reyes, Bradley, Rosario. Hopefully Cleveland can score at least two, look to tie or take the win as the Royals go back to Scott Barlow looking for save number 43. With one away, it's Bobby Bradley who is still hitting the ball at a very high level. OPS above 1,000 in just over 70 at-bats as he will check his swing on the fastball. Two gone now. The game comes down to the bat of Eddie Rosario, who's been good today. Three for four. Three-one pitch. Outside slider for ball four. So Rosario draws a walk. The tying run is at the plate. It's Josh Bell, who is one for one. He's drawn a ton of walks today, which is very typical of Josh Bell. One-one pitch on its way. He pops it up to short. And it will be caught by Nicky Lopez. And the Kansas City Royals are doing a darn good job of playing spoiler. They win the first two games of the series, taking this one home 8-6. We had this game won. We were up big early, but the Royals scored the final five runs of the day. Two in the seventh, three in the eighth. We just choked. That, that's what happened. The bullpen choked. Cal Quantrill didn't have his best day, but he's not the reason why we lost. And the offense was pretty good. Homer for Eddie Rosario, six runs, 11 hits. I thought the offense did a pretty good job, but Weathers and Alvarez and, to an extent, Duvall all kind of blew it for us. So that brings us to the final game of a regular season. The White Sox just beat Detroit. So now we are tied in the American League Central. As can tell Marte is fully healthy. We're not going to check on the other teams because they don't matter to us anymore. It's us and the White Sox at the top of this division to get a playoff spot. So with both teams tied and one game to go, this is what the situation looks like. If we win today and the White Sox lose, we win, they're out. If we lose and they win, we're out, they're in. If both Cleveland and Chicago win or both Cleveland and Chicago lose, there will be a final regular season game between Cleveland and Chicago to determine who wins the division. After this game, we will simcast the White Sox and Tigers game to add to the suspense. We're doing this game first. Tristan McKenzie on the bump for Cleveland. He's been one of our most consistent players through the season, which is why I really wanted to make it a point to have him scheduled for this game in case we really needed him. And obviously, we really need him to come through. So hopefully he can against a talented Kansas City lineup who's looking to end the year off on a sweep. We start with Isaac Benitez, who grounds it to third. Ramirez is unable to quite make the play, so it's an infield single for the Cleveland killer. Benitez opens this one on base. Andrew Benintendi now up as Benitez heads for second, and that's a double play to end the inning. That was not Benitez who stole second, actually. That was Bronson Kluderman who reached base off of the fielder's choice. So Benitez strikes out, and then Kluderman is gunned down by Luis Campusano. Brady Senior on the mound for Kansas City. His numbers are awfully similar to Tristan McKenzie's this year. I'm not going to lie. He's been very good in his own right for the Royals as we start with Jose Ramirez. He's going to draw a walk on the inside fastball. These guys know how important this game is. Without a doubt, the most important game in this entire franchise series yet. We don't necessarily have to win to be in, but in order to control our own fate, we got to win. If we win this game, worst case scenario is we have a game 163. If we lose today... Best case scenario is a game 163 as Hanniger goes down looking on the outside fastball. Nice job by McKenzie to just clip the corner of the strike zone. Zio Urshela draws a walk, barely just out of the zone. So Urshela is aboard. That'll bring up Adalberto Mondesi with two away. Grounds it to third. Ramirez gets it over to second. That's Marte. 
So far, so good for Tristan McKenzie. He's not looking too bad, only allowing one hit and one walk. The pitch count is fairly low. He's doing a really good job so far. But the problem is Brady Sr. is also doing a good job as he gets Bobby Bradley to go down looking on the outside slider. His second K of the day, two away now for Eddie Rosario, the one-two. He goes down chasing on the circle change. Cleveland's lineup has some of the best discipline in baseball. I don't know why Rosario was chasing there. Still scoreless through two. Not a lot of offense up to this point as we go to the third. MJ Melendez, one of the top prospects in the Royals organization at catcher, goes down on the changeup. Charlie Culberson now up. He's going to fly this one into right field. Reyes will not make the diving play. Culberson rounds first, headed to second. The throw from Reyes is in though. It's safe. It really looked like they were going to gun him down. Reyes does a good job of quickly getting up and making the throw. I want to take another look here because in real time, it kind of looked like Culberson was out. It's very, very close. That wasn't a good angle. This also not a good angle because the umpire is in the way. So let's get a better close-up view to see if Culberson was safe. And as he's sliding in here, yeah, they did make the right call. He was safe. So Culberson is in scoring position with two away for the Cleveland killer, Isaac Benitez, and he strikes out. Big K for Tristan McKenzie. Bronson Kluderman now up. Flies this one in the left. Should be caught by Rosario, and it will. Three scoreless innings for Tristan McKenzie. He is doing his part so far in the biggest major league start of his career. Still scoreless here in the bottom of the third. Which team will drive in runs first? Capuchana leads off the inning for Cleveland. He nearly gets plunked. These two teams know a thing about throwing balls at each other's batters. So Campusano is aboard. One away now for Cattell. Marte lines this one nicely into left center field. That'll go for a hit. Campusano round second, heads third. The throw from the center fielder is close, but not in time. So the Guardians now have runners here on the corners and one away. A big opportunity here for the rookie sensation, George Valera, in the biggest major league game of his career. He's going to ground this one over to the pitcher. Senior's just going to play it safe, get the out at first. The runner, Campusano, does score from third, so the Cleveland Guardians are on the board. They lead 1-0. Jose Ramirez strikes out on the fastball, so that'll wrap up the third. Finally, Cleveland is on the board. They lead this one 1-0 through three. We'll see if either team can start to break away here offensively towards the middle of this game. Benintendi leads feeding off for the Royals, and he is out. Nice job by Andres Jimenez to quickly get over to it and fire the throw over to first base. Mitch Hanniger goes down looking on the fastball again. Tristan McKenzie continuing to pitch very, very well. His fifth strikeout of the game. Following batter, Gio Urshela. He's going to weakly hit this one into right. It will go for a base hit. Both teams are doing a decent job of getting base runners. They're just having trouble, specifically Kansas City, of driving them in as Olivarius strikes out. So that'll end the fourth inning. Four scoreless for Tristan McKenzie. He is pitching very well right now. We're going to go into the bottom of the fourth. We'll see if the Cleveland Guardians can extend the lead as Reyes leads it off. 3-1 pitch, gets a circle change right in the middle of the zone, and he's going to capitalize. That's a home run. Solo shot in the right field for Reyes. The possible American League MVP with his 42nd of the year, and the Cleveland Guardians now lead this game 2-0. Following batter, Bobby Bradley checks his swing on the fastball. Bradley is retired, his second time being struck out today, senior with his sixth. Following batter, Josh Bell with a mammoth shot in the right center field. I don't think this one stays in the ballpark. It will not. Solo home run for Josh Bell, and the Cleveland offense is figuring it out. Bell with his 27th home run of the season. Bell and Reyes both go deep here in the bottom of the fourth, and so the Guardians lead 3-0. Still only one out. They're looking for more. Eddie Rosario draws a walk. So Rosario is now aboard. Senior starting to struggle. Look at his pitch count. It's at 83. Andres Jimenez watches that one sail by. Dropped by Melendez. Rosario advances to second off of the passed ball. So the count is full here for Jimenez. Run scores a run. Or obviously run scores a run. I meant to say a single scores a run, but Jimenez draws a walk instead. So now there's two runners on here, two outs, and Senior is taken out of the game. He'll be replaced by Carlos Hernandez, the long reliever for the Royals with a 5.47 ERA as he faces off against Quetzal Marte, who flies this one in the deep center. But it will be caught for the final out of the inning. Still a good one for the Guardians. They score two. 
pair of solo home runs from Fran Mil Reyes and Josh Bell. We move to the fifth. Tristan McKenzie still doing very well as Melendez barely puts any contact on the ball. Good job by Campusano to quickly get over to it for the second out of the inning. That'll bring up Charlie Culbers, and he hit the double earlier. Flies this one weakly into right, and it will be caught by Fran Mil Reyes. Five scoreless innings for Tristan McKenzie. The Guardians are looking good at the moment. Hopefully they can keep it going here as we go into the bottom of the fifth. George Valera leads the inning off of a bomb in a right field. Places the bat down. The star rookie with his 18th home run of the year. And the Cleveland Guardians now lead 4-0. Solo home runs from Reyes, Bell, and Valera. And the Guardians are looking good, but they're not done. Jose Ramirez, that one just shy of a homer, stays in the ballpark. It looks like it will go for a double, and with still nobody out, Cleveland has a great opportunity to do some more damage. Ramirez with his 40th double of the year. Fran Mill Reyes is now up. He had the home run earlier. Going to keep this one in the ballpark as he strikes out on the fastball. Bobby Bradley is now up. This one will not stay in the ballpark. Oppo Taco, two-run homer for Bradley. And the Guardians are exploding at the moment. Bobby Bradley with his seventh home run of the season. And this game has quickly turned into a blowout as the Cleveland Guardians now lead 6 to nothing. The power really coming alive here for Cleveland as Hernandez is taken out of the game and will be replaced by Ross Stripling. Stripling will face off against Josh Bell. He goes down looking at the fastball. That one looked out of the zone, but I guess not, according to Angel Hernandez there behind the dish. Eddie Rosario now up. 1-1. Going to fly this one into foul territory. Can the right fielder make the play? He does. Still a really good inning, though. Cleveland doubles their lead off of a solo home run from George Valera and a two-run homer for Bobby Bradley. In the sixth inning, Isaac Benitez leads Vinny off with a... No, he's out. I was going to say infield single, but Andres Jimenez, again, barely beats out the runner. That'll bring up the third baseman, Bronson Kluderman, who's been quiet today. He's going to hit this one nicely in the left field. That'll drop for a hit. So the Royals have a runner aboard. We'll see if they can finally do anything with this base runner. As with two away, it's Mitch Hanniger. He draws a walk. McKenzie's pitch count starting to get a little bit higher now at 93. Got to look out for maybe a pitching change as Gio Urshela is going to hit this one nicely into center field. Kluderman will score. Hanniger advances to third. And the Royals are now on the board as it's 6-1. to one. From there, Tristan McKenzie will be taken out of the game. A phenomenal performance on the mound from Tristan McKenzie. Five and two-thirds innings, one earned run so far. Could go up to three, depending on how Keenan Middleton can finish off the inning. And he's going to get Oliveris to go down looking. Good work from Middleton to finish it off. The Royals do score one, but they still trail six to one. As we move into the bottom half of the sixth inning, we'll see if the Guardians can look to extend this lead even more. While Stripling's still in the game as he gets on to Jimenez to go down looking. I feel like the umpire behind the dish has called really everything that's like outside on the right side of the plate a strike. At least he's consistent. Cattell Marte grounds out to short. Nice job to quickly field it and throw it by Nicky Lopez. With three innings to go, Cleveland looks good. They lead 6-1 to one as Oinks Quackenbush will check in here in the top of the 7th. 2.89 ERA and 9 and thirds innings. He's been pretty good so far for Cleveland since he got called up. Here's MJ Melendez into deep left. Nice catch by Eddie Rosario for the second out of the inning. Good work there from Rosario. That'll bring up Charlie Culver's in 2-2. Grounds it to third. And it was actually more of a liner. Didn't hit the ground. Instead, it hits Ramirez's glove. The mascot is celebrating. It's a good time right now at the ballpark because Cleveland's leading big. 6-1 to one here going into the bottom of the 7th. George Valera, who homered in his last at bat, will lead the inning off. Count as 1-2. and two. That was a nasty pitch. I'm not going to lie. Can't blame Valera for thinking that was going to go way low, but Ross Stripling's going to get him looking. Fran Mil Reyes now with two away. Flies it into center field. Should be caught pretty easily. The Cleveland lineup has certainly slowed down the past couple of innings, but that hasn't really mattered because, well, the Guardians are still up by five. As long as Cleveland doesn't have some epic collapse, they should be fine. Kansas City will start the eighth inning off with a quick single, so they've got an early runner aboard. That's Isaac Benitez, the Cleveland killer, with another base hit as Andrew Benintendi then draws a walk. Two runners on, one away. That'll bring up Mitch Hanniger, who grounds this one nicely into right field that should score Benitez. Throw on its way from Fran Mil Reyes, 
and it is offline. So it's an RBI single for Hanniger. It's now 6-2. to two. Banks Quackenbush really not doing well here in the eighth inning, so he will be replaced by Nick Sandlin, who hopefully can get Cleveland out of the inning and into the ninth. With one away, Urshela grounds it to short. Possible double play. 6-4-3. Cleveland gets two. The runner at third does not score. And the Guardians lead this game 6-2 going into the bottom of the eighth. Cleveland can just taste victory right now. Joel Piumps is in for the Royals with two away. He bases all against pinch hitter Elliot Ramos, who draws a walk. So Ramos is on base. That'll bring you up the pinch hitter for Campusano, which is going to be Josh Naylor hitting exactly 250 this year. He swings at a pitch he shouldn't have. A way low and inside circle change. So Naylor is out, frustrated with himself. And we're now going to go into the ninth inning where Cleveland's going to look to finish off the game. It's a four-run game, so it's not a save opportunity, but we don't want to mess around. We want our best pitcher to finish off this game. That's Emmanuel Classe. Edward Olivares leads feeding off, grounding out to third. And Cleveland is two outs away from maybe winning the division. Alberto Mondesi grounds it to second. Marte over to Bell. And now Cleveland is one out away from getting the victory. The game comes down to the bat of MJ Melendez, who lines it into right, caught by Reyes in the regular season. Well, the first 162 games of a regular season is over as Cleveland wins at 6-2, and their record is now 90-72. and So the worst-case scenario is that we're going to have a game 163 against the White Sox, which, if that does happen, that would be in the next episode. In order for a game 163 to happen, the White Sox have to beat Detroit. If the White Sox lose to Detroit, then we win the division outright. We're in the playoffs. They're not. It's that simple. We played well today. Six runs, six hits. The offense really did nothing once... Uh, we went on our little run the last, like, three innings. We didn't hit the ball well at all, but that didn't really matter because when guys got on base, we capitalized. We went deep four times in this game. Reyes, Bell, and Valera had solo homers. Bobby Bradley had a two-run shot. Tristan McKenzie pitched very well. The bullpen pitched very well, too. So now we get to Chicago's final game. Dylan Cease on the mound for them against Casey Mize for Detroit. We have to use her somebody for quick manage, so since we want the Tigers to win... We're going to user them and make their decisions for them. I edited their lineup to how I thought they would be best suited to win the game here against the White Sox. The Tigers scored five in the third inning. They lead this one 5 0 off a pair of home runs from Riley Green and Spencer Torkelson. They add another one in the sixth. Yeah, this is looking way too easy. Bottom of the ninth, Casey Bias going for the complete game, and he gets it. The Tigers beat the White Sox 6 to nothing. All of Detroit's top draft picks came up clutch today. Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green, and Casey Mize all played fantastic. So with the White Sox losing and us winning, you know what that means. The Cleveland Guardians have clinched the American League Central and will be in the postseason. <laughs> It came down to the final game of the season, but we win the Central, and we're going to play against the AL East champion Toronto Blue Jays in the ALDS. The Blue Jays did not lead the Central for most of the year, but they got by the Yankees late. So the Yankees at 91-71 and 71 will be one of the wild card teams. They will play against the Houston Astros. The winner of that game will face off against the number one seeded Los Angeles Angels. The Blue Jays are the two seed since they won 92 games. We're the three seed since we won 90 games. So Toronto has home field advantage with us. The National League, as expected, the Brewers did end up winning the NL Central. And as I said, the National League ending was a lot less exciting and climactic compared to the end of the American League season. Here's a look at our team's statistics. We currently have 28 guys on the active roster for the playoffs. We have to cut it down to 26. So we got to figure out two guys who we want to send down to AAA. We cannot send down Ryan Bliss because he's a Rule 5 draft pick. Everybody else is fair game. So we've got to figure out uh, who are the two players who are least likely to contribute. And from there... We're going to send those guys down to AAA. These are all of the stats for the regular season. Sure enough, we did take home some awards. Shane Bieber wins the Cy Young, and Fran Mill Reyes wins the American League MVP. So the two biggest awards in baseball, the MVP and the Cy Young, go to players on our team. Fran Mill Reyes, our designated hitter, finished the year with 42 home runs, 127 RBIs, with a slash line of 276, 354, 546 for an OPS of 900. You don't normally see DHs win MVP, but... I'm not complaining, even though I would argue somebody who played defense maybe should have gotten it over him. Shane Bieber wins his second career Cy Young. He won one in the shortened 2020 season. 
You could argue there's an asterisk since he only started 12 games, but this year he started the entire year and was damn good. 3.02 ERA, 1.14 whip, 213 strikeouts. Phenomenal season from him. Here are the other awards. Uh, no Emmanuel Classe in the top three for the reliever of the year. That's kind of disrespectful. George Valera does finish second for rookie of the year. Had he played the entire season in the majors, he would have won that pretty easily. He also... I would venture out to say, would have been an MVP candidate. Valera played half the year. If you multiply his numbers by two, he's in the MVP running. We did not have anybody win a gold glove. We did have some silver sluggers. Franmil Reyes won it for designated hitter. Jose Ramirez won it for third base. So we take home four awards, a pair of silver sluggers, the American League MVP with Franmil Reyes, and the American League Cy Young with Shane Bieber. These awards are nice. They help out individual legacies, but they don't matter in the grand scheme of things. Because next episode, we're playing playoff baseball for the first time in this series against the American League East champion, Toronto Blue Jays. We played them earlier today, so we know these guys quite well. They're a really talented group. They've got a great lineup. Their pitching rotation is very top-heavy. They have three ace-caliber guys at the top with Alec Manoa, Jose Barrios, and Kevin Gossman. But after that, it's a big drop-off with Joey Murray, who did not have a good season this year, and Nate Pearson, who did not pitch at all in the big leagues. I'm not really sure why they're going with him, but I'm not complaining. Those three guys at the top, though, are quite intimidating. I'm not going to lie. So that's going to wrap up the episode. An hour-plus ending of a regular season finishes out with the double-A team, unfortunately, losing in the championship, but the Cleveland Guardians making up for it, winning the AL Central, and playing in the ALDS against the Toronto Blue Jays. Next episode, we're going to kick off the playoffs. I cannot wait. Should be a ton of fun. Make sure the like button and subscribe. This was obviously a long video to put together. It was pretty much two videos in one, so I hope you really enjoyed it because I had a lot of fun doing it. Peace out.